We are Taylor and Peter Johnson, and we've been coming to Declaration since the very first planning meeting. So we've been coming to Declaration for the last six years, and it's been beautiful. We've grown a lot, our kids have grown a lot, and it's been a wonderful time. Hearing God has always been a desire of my heart, but it's always been possibly the biggest struggle I've had as a believer. Uh, being a very analytical person, wanting to know for certain that it was God's voice and not my own. When the church launched the movement a couple of years ago, on advanced commitment night, I had written down a number that I felt comfortable with. A week or two later, when the main Sunday came for the main commitment, um, my first thought was, okay, why do I need to write this down again? Because I already wrote it the week before, right? But he said to pray and to, you know, write the number down. So I prayed, not expecting to hear anything, certainly not expecting to change my number. Uh, we had already had peace about it. But I clearly saw this number in my mind that was double that which I had written down on advanced commitment night. And I was not eager to write that down, um, but I couldn't get it out of my head. So I wrote it down. Very shortly thereafter, and it might have been the same day, I felt like God gave me another picture of another number that he was preparing us to give in the future when the next initiative was launched. And that number was three and a half times the doubled number that I had just written down. I remember thinking, oh, okay. And just kind of questioning in my mind, like, is that really what God wants us to give. And so I just prayed, I was like, God, if that's what you want us to give, then just confirm that. Fast forward two years, church launches setting the table. I thought, hold on here. God doubled our income, our take home income in the last two years. And then I also immediately saw that third number that he had given me pretty clearly. And I knew that he wanted us to give that. As much as I didn't want to believe it, I knew it. And I thought, okay, is this really from God or is this me? Because again, this is my whole struggle. It's like, how do I know if it was God or not? But at the end of the day, I was like, okay, it's not from the enemy because why would the enemy want us to contribute to building God's kingdom? It's certainly not from the world because the world would tell us to save it. Um, it certainly wasn't from my flesh because I could think of plenty of things I could buy with that. So I concluded that it must be from God. And I also thought, okay, even if I totally botched this and I didn't hear God, he's still sovereign enough and big enough to honor our faith in writing it down. So I wrote it down, but then I had a lot of apprehension about, okay, what if I can't fulfill this? You know, what if we put the church in some precarious situation. And I thought about James 4, where it talks about, um, you know, not boasting about tomorrow because you don't know what tomorrow's gonna bring. Um, she reminded me, it's like, like stop seeing this as some work that you have to do to strive like for God and see it as an opportunity to walk with God, joining him in what he's already doing, just like a son would join his father in his work. And then I remembered Pastor John's weekly reminder to not have analysis paralysis and just pray and ask God for a number and write it down and have faith and follow through with that and trust that he's big enough you know, to honor that. I'm most excited to see what God does and how he enables us to fulfill this, not in any sort of um, like prosperity gospel way, but simply trusting that we heard God correctly and trusting that he's sovereign enough to be able to provide. I think it's it's a privilege to be able to give and I, I think it's exciting that we get to see, you know, this building unfold in this new church and see new people come in and to know that you've had a part in that is such a blessing. I think that day I'll probably be in tears just that first day when all the kids come in and families and it'll be beautiful. Amen. Hey, welcome to church, everybody. Welcome to church. Can we just welcome everyone joining us online as we dismiss our fifth and sixth graders? All right. Well, um, in, in case you're a little confused, you may be going, okay, wait, the table's back, and we just heard about that. Different series altogether, okay? 
different series. In fact, let's start this way. The, the story is told of two men riding a tandem bicycle up a very steep hill. And after an incredible amount of effort, they finally make it to the top of the hill. And the front rider says, uh, in fact, that's kind of what the bike might have looked like. The front rider says, gosh, that was, that was a tough ride. I mean, that was just... That was hard. And the second rider behind says, man, it sure was. And, and if I hadn't kept the brakes on, we may have slipped backwards. <laughs> now listen, the moral of that story, it, it, can, it can become counterproductive when we are not all moving in the same direction, right? Even sometimes when we, we may think that we're even helping. And, and that's the goal of this new series. Um, in fact, we're going to see the table a couple of times this year because... I really believe that the table is deeply important to life. Um, Obviously, Jesus used it a lot. We're going to talk about that. Um, And and so, you know, the goal of the series is this, to encourage us all to make sure that we are all in unity and community. There's this word koinonia, fellowship, that we're all walking together together. In unity and community, moving in the same direction, missionally, as well as under the banner of this vision of helping people encounter and following Jesus. As we are encouraging each other in our church together to be daily about encountering and following Jesus. Amen. Can I just kind of piggyback off of a moment in worship? And I really kind of battled with this, uh, just interrupting the team. Um, I want to just ask you, maybe right now, this morning, on this Pentecost Sunday, um, this idea, you know, Pastor Aaron read some of the the scripture uh, from Acts chapter 2 on that Pentecost, which we're going to talk about today. But just this idea that I I couldn't get away from, there's probably a lot of us in the room right now, and we just need the Lord to rest on us. Anybody? Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying in one of these crazy charismatic, supernatural, all of a sudden we're going to look up and see fire hovering everywhere kind of way. If that's, yes, God, bring that too, right? I mean, I'll take that. But I mean that there, there's some of us right now walking through a season. We're in a moment, and we really need God to just rest on us, rest on our lives. Can we pray for that for just a minute? Let's pray. Jesus, we trust you, and we lean into you. And God, I can think of nothing more important even right now in this moment in the family of this church, just to pray for one another. Just to believe for one another. To to ask God that you would just increase our faith as we declare just your grace on one another. Your healing on one another. God, you are a God who sees, who knows, who loves, who heals, who restores, who renews, who revives. God, it's your breath in our lungs. God, It is not an accident that we're taking every breath that we're taking. And it is with purpose, for purpose. And so, Jesus, we ask you, Holy Spirit, would you rest on each of us today? Right now in this moment, would you rest on us? And just as you did at that Pentecost that we'll read about, God, would you just indwell in us, in a new, fresh, incredibly powerful way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I want to honor um, the the video work that you see. A lot of this video work is actually this guy right here who plays electric. His name is Christian. Can we thank him? He is an incredibly talented, and I want to honor him because not only is he obviously deeply talented, but man, that guy has such a cool heart for the Lord and for people, and we're so thankful he's a part of this family. Amen. But let me ask you a question. If you could identify what a healthy church looks like, or if you could go to the perfect church, right, what would that be? What would that look like? P.S., there is no perfect church. But if there was, and you came in, you just screwed it up, all right? Just playing. But if you could find the perfect church, what would that look like, right? I mean, would it be like, oh, man, they got awesome coffee, you know? They got, like, um, all kind of spinny lights and stuff. It's awesome, right? I mean... They got, a, they got a slide from the second floor to the first floor in their kid's wing, right? They got an amazing worship team. Man, they all look good. They wear team tiny pants and got Hillsong hair. It's awesome, right? 
What is the perfect church? What does that look like? What does a good, healthy church look like in your mind? Now, where there's so many things that we could probably say that could define a healthy church, the one thing that I really want us to focus on right now in this season is healthy internal biblical community. Internal. Now, of course we want to be outward focused. In fact, so much so, we spent a lot of time this year setting our target for maximum impact. Maximum kingdom impact. That's what our whole series and the whole initiative that you heard Peter and Taylor talk about. That's what setting the table was all about. Man, we, we got in to this place together we asked the lord to align our heart with his um, as it pertains to mission and vision and people and uh you know that we asked that god would give us a heart for the people that he loves that he would align our heart um, around this vision that he's given us for people in our city and 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 our calling in all of that getting our heart around obedience total self-denial being completely willing to yield every part of our lives to him including even our time and our talents and our generosity all of those things so we've set our our target for maximum kingdom impact through setting the table and and while being outward focused is very 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 important i wanted us this summer to take a few weeks just six weeks together and just think and look inward for a second just look inward that's why it's not setting the table we're going to do that that's what we are we're table setters just by calling we are ministers on mission but I wanted to take six weeks to, what does it look like to be around the table? When you're sitting at the table, eye to eye with each other. What does that look like? Are we doing that well, right? Important to note now, throughout this whole series, we're going to look at this from a kingdom perspective. We're gonna, I pray we're going to look at this through the eyes of Jesus. Um, so there's a premise that we're working from as we consider how we live life around the table. First thing is this. Number one, seeking and saving was the mission of Jesus. Do you believe that? Seeking and saving was the mission of Jesus. I'll prove it for you. Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says this. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. So seeking and saving. This is his words. This was his mission. Don't forget, Jesus wants everyone at the table. Remember, we said that over and over, and that's so true. He wants, for God so loved the world. Now, Jesus comes, and his mission is to seek and save. With that in mind, there's a second thing, that, this kind of a premise that we're going to work from. And this is this. This one, this one could frustrate some, but, but I'm going to prove this one to you as well. Number two, eating and drinking was the methodology, it was the methodology of Jesus. Eating and drinking was a methodology he used a lot. He spent so much time with all sorts of different types of people in houses, at dinners, at parties, at weddings, at celebrations. He would invite himself to your house. I mean, he would literally, he would literally walk people into the kingdom one meal at a time. Consider guys like Simon or even um, guys like Zacchaeus. We see this proof of eating and drinking being the methodology of Jesus in Luke chapter 7. Um, I believe verse 33 and 34, where Jesus is pointing out just a little bit of hip hypocrisy in those religious zealots standing in judgment over him. Look what he says. He starts talking about John. He says, for John the Baptist, he did not spend his time eating bread or drinking wine. And you said that he was possessed by a demon. But the son of man, on the other hand, he feasts and drinks. And you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So here we see it. Eating and drinking was the methodology of Jesus. He spent a lot of time around a lot of tables with so many people because seeking and saving was the mission of Jesus. He used the table in so many contexts to develop and to deepen relationship. He used the table to reach the last, the lost, and the least. He used the table to teach and to train and, listen, to call out truth in people about who they were. Who God had created them to be. This is how Jesus used tables. He used tables to, as a tool basically to display his, his great love. And he invites us to do the same thing. So I want you to think about culture for just a minute. And how Jesus used the table. But also even consider our culture today. Think about some of the, the amazing things that take place at this center point of so many homes, if you will. The centerpiece of the home. It might not sit dead center. But I'm telling you, it's a very important part of your home. I mean, think about Thanksgiving. How many Thanksgiving meals? I can go back years and years and years and remember my dad and some of the things that he would say at a Christmas meal or at Thanksgiving. I mean, even the daily conversations that matter. 
You may think they don't, but they do. There is statistical evidence of what happens in a family unit when mom, dad, and children sit at a table and have a meal together if only two days a week. It's so important. So important. All focused around the table. Now, in Mark chapter 12, 29 through 31, we see Jesus reiterate something that we've seen before, even in Old Testament. He's asked a question, and he says this, the greatest commandment is to what? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And, and, with, and then and the second, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, there's no other commandment greater than these. So Jesus couples two big ideas together under this umbrella of one great commandment. And in his words, include the concept of community. Community, listen, is cultivated around tables. Think about how many lunch meetings you have. Maybe dinner gatherings. Community is cultivated around tables. Also, we see in that word community, I believe how Jesus uses it, we see another word, which is just unity. If you look at the verse right before Jesus gives the greatest commandment, look what he says in verse 29. He says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We know contextually by going to John 17 in that great high priestly prayer that Jesus has a passionate heart about unity, especially in the body of Christ. Unity is, listen to me, unity is a deeply important priority in the kingdom of God. Now, with that in mind, please don't hear me say unity has to mean uniformity. Not everybody has to think the same, look the same, dress the same, act the same. In fact, I pray often, 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 if not weekly, that God will continue to expand this family to look incredibly different. Because that's what the kingdom of God is like. It's beautiful. Listen to me. We don't all have to be the same. If we were all the same, unity would be very easy, would it not? But there is such rich, God-glorifying beauty when a diversity of community chooses to pursue and portray unity. So I want us to go to Acts 2 on this Pentecost Sunday because I can think of no better way to jump into this new series called Around the Table than by looking at an incredibly important Pentecost Sunday in Scripture. It was the Pentecost Sunday that gave birth to the New Testament church. So I know Pastor Aaron read part of it. We're going to blow through some of it because I want you to see some key things. Number, or, or actually verse 1, look at it. It says, on the day of Pentecost, here we're going to see it right from the top. We see community and unity take place. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers, somebody say all. All the believers were meeting together in one place. These people had come from all over. This was a religious festival. It was time. And here they are, all together, meeting in one place. This is the first thing I want you to glean from the text today. The byproduct of Jesus' ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension resulted in a call to authentic community. Pentecost enables authentic community. Pentecost enables us today, in the year 2022, to have a beautiful diversity in authentic community, because only the Holy Spirit can bring all kind of different people together under the banner of the name of Jesus, and it works. I don't know if you've looked at the news much lately, followed social media much lately. The devil dances in division, can I tell you? And so it requires the Holy Spirit for this type of authentic unity. Pentecost enabled it. I mean, look at this. Remember, Pentecost, 50 days after Easter, it's the moment that Jesus had told them to wait for. Tensions were high in Jerusalem. Peter had denied Jesus already three times. Judas had sold Jesus out. We know how that story ended. The disciples had seen the callous, horrific nature of Jesus' crucifixion, and they were experiencing the all-out chaos of the aftermath. Can you imagine the fear that must have gripped them? And, and Jesus says, stay here for another like 10 days or so. Just hang out, right? I mean, it was in the upper room around the table during that last meal together where Jesus had an intimate and life-altering conversation with his most faithful followers. Remember, he took the body and the bread, talked about his death and his resurrection. I mean, what this would mean to them. And then he tells them to wait there for the promise. Then we see in Acts 1, 4, the ascension right before. He says, wait, hang out here for the promise, the promise 
is coming. And here is this moment, 10 days after the ascension of Jesus, where he left them to it. They're all still there waiting in community as he called them to do. And the Pentecost celebration is at hand. In verse 2, suddenly there's a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it fills the house where they're sitting. Then what look like flames of, or tongues of fire appears to settle, to rest on each of them. And everyone present is filled with the Holy Spirit and begins speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability, which is an incredible moment, leads us to the second thing I hope you see today. Number two, the byproduct of Jesus' ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension results in not just community, but empowerment. I mean, Pentecost enables empowerment. Now, don't let this section freak you out if you're like me and you grew up in a certain type of stream that said, this is all crazy stuff and we don't believe it. Don't let this freak you out, please. I want to break it down just a little bit because we can look at this gift of tongues. And this gift has been widely debated. But don't forget, it's a gift. Somebody say gift. I mean, James 1 we, we had the pleasure of serving this father of lights that, that, that is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Gift meaning charis. I mean, this is a grace gift. It's a gift of a good father who gives good gifts. So this concept of tongues, it's been twisted up by the devil a lot over the years to cause fear and cynicism and speculation or worse. What God gave as a gift, the enemy is used to bring division in the church, which is ironic because, listen, at Pentecost, I need you to understand, this is why it's so cool, um, what God had scattered at Babel, watch unity happen. What God had scattered at the Tower of Babel, now he regathers at Pentecost. The pride of man through the Tower of Babel causes God to scatter language and disperse it, which is a whole other message. But here we see God, you know, bringing unity back to his people at Pentecost. That's what's happening here. This gift, this moment of supernatural power on display was for the purpose of unification of that which had been divided and dispersed. But let's not focus just on this gift of tongues so much we miss the real gift of the Holy Spirit empowerment that's taking place in this moment at Pentecost. And now, because of God's promise released at Pentecost, every New Testament believer would have the ability to have this faith gift of the Holy Spirit residing within them. Romans 8, 11, the very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead can now live within you. You want to talk about victory? Man, when I got saved in my little Baptist church and nine years old, scared to death, walking down an aisle, first time, they cart me off in a little creepy room with a lady going, here, fill this card out, son. I mean, you know, it's just... A little much, a little much, a little much, a little much. But I knew that God was moving. And, and here's the truth of the matter. At nine, I can't say, it wasn't really until 15 that I felt like God was resting on me. And I understood it personally. But at nine, God used that moment to invite me into an adventurous relationship to begin to discover who he was personally. But I remember thinking, okay, well, what now? That's cool. All right. What next? What now? What now? What, what do I do now? And there I was for about six or eight, ten more years, twelve more years. What now? What now? Where does victory come from? This abundant life Jesus talks about, where does that come? Is it because you can be now good and moral that you become a Christian? That to which I would submit no. Good luck with that. Your checklist will fail you. If you don't believe me, just look at the law of sin and death, look at the mirror and the old covenant, look at the Ten Commandments, and look at that we still needed Jesus, did we not? Your, your rules and your regulations and your dogma, hear, hear me, I, with as much respect and love as I can give you, your dogma will not do it. You're going to need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to have a chance to walk in victory. Because the devil puts a target on you the minute he sees God's eye after you. Which, P.S., is before you were ever born. And so, man, this, this Holy Spirit empowerment is so, so important. So other than community, the byproduct of Jesus' ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension results in empowerment. I just realized I, I left my clock down there, so good luck. Verse 5. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone comes running. They're bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They're completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaim. These are people all from Galilee. And yet, we hear them speaking in our own native languages. I mean, here we are, right? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province. Of, so they're coming from everywhere, right? 
Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, all the areas of Libya and Cyrene. Visitors from, I mean, they're coming from everywhere. And we're understanding what these lowly Galileans are saying because they're speaking in our native tongue. What God had dispersed, he brings together. I mean, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretes and Arabs, and, and all we, we hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things that God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they ask each other. See, can I just say this? When God moves on the scene, it still amazes and perplexes people today. So let me simplify again as much as possible. Rather than focusing on the certain gift, let's focus on what God's doing in the moment. God is putting his, de- dude, he is putting his, de- I just said dude, I'm sorry. He, he, <laughs> he's, put, he's putting his divine kingdom nature and power inside of his now kingdom people. Right? He's reuniting that which had been divided. He's putting Holy Spirit in view of everyone present, which is both incredibly life-giving and deeply attractive. So this is by no means anything to be afraid of or even skeptical of. And I, listen, I know there's been so much abuse in the church when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Benefit of the doubt, man, people just want God. Can we just give the benefit of the doubt? When we launched Declaration, we, we said, no, we're going we're gonna to believe it all, every bit of it. We're not going to put God in a box. He who was yesterday is today, will be tomorrow. We believe he can. We believe he does. We believe he will. We just don't want to be weird. <laughs> That's what I said. Just don't want to be weird. You all, I mean, we all have some crazy aunts. If she's watching today, I love you. Um, <laughs> So nothing to be afraid of. I mean, nevertheless, listen, there are always some that will be cynical and skeptical. Look at verse 13. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, oh, they're just drunk. That's all. So just as many of the faithful that were amazed, there's also these faithfuls that are literally amused. I mean, they're accusing them of being drunk, to which I'd say maybe, um, but not because of wine. Or as the Bible describes it in Deuteronomy, as hard drink. That's actually in there. Go read it. Maybe drunk in the Holy Spirit. I mean, Pastor Aaron's translation called it new wine. Maybe. If that's true, give me some of that. Give me some of that. See, the result of Jesus' ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension was community and empowerment. Verse 14, then Peter steps forward. Remember Peter. He steps forward with the 11 other apostles and shouts to the crowd. Hey, yo, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews, residents of Jerusalem. And he says, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. 9 a.m. Now, somebody in the crowd right now is going, he ain't ever had a good mimosa. But listen, (laughs) go with me, all right? Peter's just saying it's in the Bible. He didn't say there was nothing about mimosas in the Bible. But he's saying it's too early. So he says, no, Peter says, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. And then Peter begins to just belt out the words of the prophet Joel from chapter 2. Somewhere around verse 28, I think. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants. And he says, men and women alike. Again, unity. Unity. Unity, And it says, and they, men and women, they will prophesy. Caveat for free. For those of you who love to argue over women's roles in the church, I know what Paul said, but also don't miss what Peter said. Don't miss what Joel said. Again, that's another message. So Peter, still quoting Joel. He says, and I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark. The moon will turn blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't this wonderful news? Everyone, he says, everyone, no matter the despair, no matter the pain, no matter the circumstances, no matter the suffering, no matter the sickness. Listen, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord can and will, it says, will be saved. Verse 22, people of Israel, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen. 
And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of lawless Gentiles. You nailed him to the cross and killed him. So here's Peter all of a sudden, the one who denied him three times in fear. Man, now this dude is filled with boldness. You nailed him there. You killed him. But, it says, God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life. Death could not keep him in its grip. King David said this about him. I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praise. My body rests in hope. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your holy one to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. There he is now, Peter, just declaring Psalm 16 all over the place. So here's the third thing. The byproduct of Jesus' ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension results not only in community and empowerment, but also in authority. This God-empowered identity that Peter is now walking in. Because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living in him. It's resting upon his life. There's an anointing. Denying Peter, who once cowered in fear, now filled with the Holy Spirit, declaring Jesus with this supernatural boldness. He goes on, verse 29 through 36, Peter continues to passionately preach. I mean, his words are fire, empowered by the Holy Spirit as he proclaims this good news, this gospel message to all who still don't believe. Which takes us to verse 37, where we'll see a few more key things today, and where we're ultimately going to land the plane. Look at 37. Peter's words, pierced. Says Peter's words pierced their hearts, basically brought great conviction. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what must we do? See, this, listen, this was their response to the gospel. What, what do we do? I mean, this was their reaction to the good news. This combined with all that they had just seen and become so, it had become so attracted to, right? Peter's words being so authentic. Peter's motives having to be pure. Why else? I mean, with the backdrop of the last few weeks that they had all experienced, why else would he speak this way in this nature and say the things that he's saying? Listen, when, when the Holy Spirit moves through an empowered people, talk about, okay, why are we doing this internal glance at one another and an internal glance at the church around it. When the Holy Spirit moves through empowered people who walk in the authority and the God-created identity and their purpose, the response of people everywhere for all time has literally been to ask, what do we do? What, what must we do? The power of the presence of God on display always precedes the kindness of God bringing conviction upon mankind. And I truly believe the gospel lived out authentically is attractive in every way. The gospel lived out authentically. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? It's not the guy who's yelling from the Bank of America parking lot two weeks ago on a bullhorn. Anybody see that or is it just me? I'm driving, doing my thing, you know, got the tunes going. Got the tunes going. But I hear something over the music and I have to turn it down and roll the window down there is a guy marching the Bank of America parking lot with a bullhorn yelling at people about Jesus no the gospel lived out authentically is attractive in every way verse 38 Peter replies each of you must repent here's what to do repent of your sins and turn to God be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, this promise, it's not just for me, it's not just for us. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away. All who have been called by the name of the Lord our God. Then Peter continues preaching for a long time. See, it's not just me. That's my biblical precedent. He, pre he preaches strongly, urging all listeners, save yourself from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church. This is the birth of the New Testament church. Added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. So here's the fourth thing. Look, the byproduct of Jesus' ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension results not only in community and empowerment and authority, but in salvation. The story goes on. And all the believers devoted themselves say devoted devoted they devoted themselves now here's the meat of the message right here if i had to sum it all up even thinking back to ruth what we just stepped out of this devotion this depth of devotion i mean even though there's 
Other things to glean from this passage, if you hear nothing else, please hear this. The byproduct of Jesus' ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension results in a lot of things. We've seen community, empowerment, authority, salvation. But the ultimate byproduct of Jesus' ministry resulted in, or maybe I should say, should overwhelmingly compel us to this depth of devotion. This thank you life. This thank you life. It says... All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals. What's necessary for sharing in the meal? It says even including the Lord's Supper, communion, Eucharist. And they devoted themselves also to prayer. Listen, this is what the church, the New Testament church, is built on. This is what our church is built on. This is is the prescribed recipe for the New Testament church. Right here, which is, I mean, if you go back to the very beginning of Declaration and look at the video when I still had all brown hair. Yeah, I'm not bitter. That's what I'm talking about. This passage right here. So let's add it up. We see the passage in by saying this deep sense of all, awe, comes over them all. And the apostles perform many miracles, signs, and wonders. So faithful community... Obedient to what Jesus prescribed leads to empowerment, authority, or this new God, just God-created empowered identity. Because of salvation, surrendering all to Jesus, which should lead to this, this life of deep devotion. And, and, what, and what started at these most faithful, intimate followers of Jesus remaining in obedience to what Jesus had told them to do. Now we see it come back around and they're all together, verse 44, in one place, unified in community. And they all share everything they have. They even sell their possessions, their property to share the money with those in need. I mean, right here we see biblical evidence of the very first benevolence fund. The story goes on to reveal to us that they worship together in the temple day by day, each day. They meet in each other's homes and take the Lord's Supper together around the table and they share meals with great joy, with great generosity, again, around the table, all while praising God and enjoying goodwill of all the people. Do you see it? The diversity of all the people coming from all the places, Spirit of God lands on the place and all of a sudden, this is the fruit. This is what it should look like, everybody. This is what it should feel like. There should be such a... And listen, don't, don't miss this either. They were devoted to one another as well. They were devoted to one another as well. They were deeply devoted, obviously, to the Lord, but they also had a deep familial connection now because once you, it's like when you go to battle with somebody, you're a brother, right? But once you spiritually battle with each other, once you encounter the glory of God in a life-altering way with one another, it's super hard to walk away from that. So they are so devoted to one another. The byproduct of Jesus' ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension results not only in community, empowerment, authority, and salvation. The Holy Spirit comes. The ultimate byproduct of Jesus' ministry results in, or maybe I should say, should overwhelmingly compel us to this, this life of deep, deep devotion and unity. Unity. Watch what happens when God's people walk in unity. And each day the Lord adds to their fellowship those who are being saved. More and more people daily attracted to the authentic gospel. Not only just being proclaimed. Listen to me because it's one thing to say it but it's another thing to do it. Not just being proclaimed but being portrayed in every way. Being lived out authentically. Let me ask you just a few questions. Are we walking in this type of unity? Are we living in this type of devotion to the Lord, but also to one another? To where it matters. Listen, it matters. Your church family so deeply matters. You will make time, not take time. Are you hearing me? You will make time for the Lord. You will make time for your family, for your church. You will. Please, please don't hear me try to boast our attendance. That's not what I'm... I'm saying this is a kingdom life principle. If you want to live in the abundant life that Jesus says you can have, you must follow the prescription for the life that he's calling you to. So would you say that your life is defined by this depth of devotion? Do you understand your identity, the authority that you carry because of Holy Spirit residing within you? Do you know, are you walking in the empowerment of Holy Spirit? Let's go back to how we began. Are we walking... And working together 
seeing the fruit of God attracting people to himself through us? Or are some of us pedaling as hard as we can, seemingly uphill, while others are holding the brakes in fear of sliding backwards? Do you feel like you're part of a unified, empowered community walking in the authority of Jesus? Do you sense a depth of devotion in our community here at Declaration? But also, with a kingdom mind and heart, with the other Jesus-centered churches in the area. I got word of a, of a church that's going to go through a really hard day today. It's one of our partner churches who I love. Man, they're, they're going to have a really hard day today on Pentecost Sunday. And I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit will do in that house what we've seen him do here and what we've seen him do in this house over and over as these people receive some of the really hardest news they'll ever receive as, as the body. And just bring a healing balm over them in this moment. And in fact, I'm praying that in my spirit right now for them. So do you feel like you're a part of this unified, empowered community walking in the authority of Jesus, right? Do you sense this depth of devotion in this house here are we devoted to the word? Listen, if, or, or, let me ask this. Are, are we devoted to the word? Or let me say it this way. Are we spending time in the word? Are we doing it? Because in love, can I just say this? The time we spend in the word will reflect the depth of how well we know the word. And by the word, I mean him. He says, I am the word. Are we spending time in the word? Are we committed and devoted to the community of Christ and the kingdom of God? There's a lot of angst right now, I know. There's so much angst in the world against the church. And sadly, somewhat rightly so. I mean, listen, in many ways, fallible men in the church have often misrepresented a faithful God. In so many ways. I pray desperately, daily, that God will just keep my mind and keep my heart and keep my hands pure. Because the enemy is after it. He's after the church. He's after pastors. The numbers of, of ministers right now of all types that, that are falling out of ministry daily are astronomically staggering. So I get it. You know, some people accidentally find themselves in a really bad spot. But others, because of their own propensity to sin, difficult. I get it. It's much easier, listen, for the world to be a fan of Jesus than a fan of his followers right now. There's so many who have so much to say about the church right now, not in a good way. Whether it's because of Me Too issues in the church being called out right now on social media in a, in a massive denomination. Whether it's the deconstruction movement gripping so many of, of the younger um, millennial crowd and, and below. Or maybe the ex-evangelical movement or the syncretism of faith and politics resulting in the Christian nationalist movement. Or even consumerism that's gripped so many in the church because somehow the theology of dying to self hasn't been taught under stood or embodied and sadly many have made themselves the hero of the story or the center of the story um, which is why you always hear me say you're such a very important part of the story you just aren't the point of the story I mean Paul did not stutter in Galatians when he says I have been crucified with Christ a call to Jesus is a call to die and so many people have just been so gripped by the capitalist nature of consumerism of our culture that they just attributed it to the church as well. And so if they don't get their way or if they don't get what they want or if they don't see what they want or if they're not treated just the way that they want or if they're looked at wrongly or what, then they're just going to go find another one. And they're going to keep doing it over and over and over. It becomes a habitual pattern in their life. They never plug into community. They talk about how they want it, but they can't get it because they're not going after it, if I'm just being honest. Let me just tell you an example from our church. Great family. Amazing family. Early in the life of the church. Love this family. So cool. And I'm not, I'm not going to say names. Because I want to honor them as much as I can. But I want you to hear this. Because it's after I don't know how many months of going back and forth. I finally sat with this gentleman. And he just finally said, here's the deal. I'm just not being fed at this church. And I went, oh, okay. I got you. I said, I hear you. And I'm sorry um, that you feel that way. I said, um, are, are, have you been really pl plugging in? I mean, are you going to small groups? Are you leading any small groups? Are you, are you digging in daily? I'm, no, I, I'm not being fed on Sunday morning. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry. I'm a worship leader gone rogue, and now I'm pastoring. I'm learning, right? <laughs> but then I felt like the Lord just kind of, but let me tell you something. Um, I... In no, 
nowhere in my God-written job description do I see that I am to spiritually spoon-feed a diaper-wearing adult. I'm just, no, I mean, seriously. And I said, I'm sorry, I said, my job is to equip the empowered to ministry. That's why you hear us talk all the time about you're a minister on mission. God called you to serve. Save people serve. It's what they do. They're living this thank you devoted life. And yes, I want you to learn things. And yes, I'm working and I'm studying and I'm going to do the best I can. But brother, you need to learn to feed yourself. Now, some of you just may have been offended by that, and I hope that you're not. But it's just a, to me, it's just a prime example of what's going on today in the church. Because of the, the culture by which we've raised, we really believe it's about us. We want to gather, 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 gather. Give me all the info. Give me all the info. Give me. Look, information is not transformation. Transformation begins to move outward. Information just keeps soaking it up. Right? Nothing wrong with it. I call it the feed me Seymour syndrome. Right? <laughs> it's all about me. I saw a statement all ago that says this. Before accusing a church of not feeding you or you having, not having community, remember how often you didn't come to dinner. You can't be unfaithful and then complain. See, it's incredibly difficult to, to be a true part of community if you aren't willing to come and be around a table. It's hard. It's impossible. Let me give you another freebie. A very popular belief today is that you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And while that's theologically true, it is not congruent to say, I love you, Jesus, while you hate and tear down and or want nothing to do with his bride. It's not congruent. You can't, listen, you cannot be in but not of when it comes to the kingdom of God. You can't. The church is the system that God created to carry out his mission. And the church isn't an institution, it's an embodiment. We are the church. That's why you hear me say all the time, it's not about building buildings, it's about building people. The whole thing that we're doing has nothing to do with building a building. It's about building the kingdom of God in people. The church is not an institution. It's an identity. And so many today are divorcing themselves from the God-created identity and claiming their own version of Christianity. As long as it suits them and fits their design. You see it? Let me ask you, do you feel a part of the church or just on the sidelines? And then let me ask you this, who's responsible for cultivating community? Who is it? Some would say it's my job, but I would say it's not the pastor, it's the parishioner's responsibility. See, I learned a long time ago, I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make it, nope, I can't make it thirsty. And Jesus in John 7 said, hey, if you're thirsty, who will come and drink? Not my responsibility. I'm going to do the best. We're going to, our staff works. I'm telling you, man. But listen, if you want to walk in this empowered identity of authority, understanding that there's something more in your salvation than checking a box and walking an aisle, understanding that there is an adventurous life waiting for you in this calling to be a part of something that's going to make an eternal impact, I mean an eternal difference on generations to come, the only place that I see in Scripture over and over where that is going to happen is in the context of the local community of believers in Jesus. You can make a difference in a lot of things, but will it be eternal? Verse 42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship. They were devoting themselves to one another, to getting around the table and sharing meals. Miracles, signs and wonders were happening. A deep sense of awe came over them. They were devoted to prayer. In verse 46, as they worshiped together in the temple every day, they met in homes together to take communion around the table. They shared meals with great joy all while praising God, enjoying the goodwill. Now, I've heard people say this as we wrap up. I have better community at the bar and the ball field than I do at church. And I would say, how sad. How sad is that? How sad is that? Watch this video real quick. Very short. Check this out. I came to my church once, and, and he was a part of a gang and, uh, and decided to ditch everything. And and follow Jesus and he got baptized and after a while though he stopped coming to 
the, the church gatherings. And, and one of my buddies asked him, they go, hey, what, where you been? He, he says, when I got baptized, he goes, I thought that it was gonna be like when I got jumped into the gang. He goes, when I got jumped into my gang, he goes, suddenly everyone had my back. We became like a family 24 seven. He says, so when I got baptized, I thought, this is what's gonna happen with the Christians. He goes, I, I didn't know that it was just Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. He goes, I thought it was gonna be family. So he goes, I, I just had it wrong in my head. And yet when I heard that, I thought, no, you got it right. We've got it wrong. And, and honestly, it was heartbreaking because I thought the gangs are a better picture of family than the church is. The gangs are a better picture of the body than, than we are. They're having a fellowship and a sharing that we don't see in the church of Jesus Christ. And yet that's the very thing that Jesus wanted for us. So how sad that, that for those who would say, man, I find better community over here or over there, what that tells me is that they must not have encountered God in a way like these did at Pentecost that we read about. So much so that it would drive and compel us till we cannot help ourselves but to surrender to, to I mean, the totality of our lives to all that he has for us. I'm going to read you something real briefly. This is a book that I've had for years, and how I came across this is crazy, trust me. So I felt like the Lord wanted me to just share a bit of it. The book's called What Happened from the Cross to the Throne. Listen to what it says, what Satan saw on the day of Pentecost. Satan had conquered Jesus on the cross. He had stirred the selfish hearts of the high priesthood until this, in a jealous frenzy they had crucified him. The Father had laid on him the sins of the world. Jesus was left alone. God turned his back on him. Satan, le Satan triumphantly bore his spirit to the dark regions of Hades. All the sufferings and torments that hell could produce were heaped upon Jesus. When he had suffered all of hell's agony for three days and three nights, the supreme court of the universe cried, Enough! He had paid the penalty and met the claims of justice. Satan saw him justified. God made him alive in spirit right there in the presence of the cohorts of hell. Jesus was made a new creation, Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, he also foreordained to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Colossians 1, 18. For he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jesus was born into the new covenant in that moment. Colossians 2, 15 describes it in part, having put off... From himself, the principalities and the powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Satan was defeated, Hebrews 2.15, and might deliver all them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. See, Jesus paralyzed the death-dealing authority of Satan. He took captivity captive. He defeated the host of hell as our substitute. In the upper room, Satan witnessed the results. He saw men and women recreated. He saw them receive eternal life. He saw their sins remitted, blotted out as though they had never been. He saw the power and energy of the Holy Spirit in men. He became aware of the fact that the new creation people are his masters. He realized that these men and women had the authority to use the name of Jesus. These men and women in the upper room would be able to perform the same kind of miracles that Jesus had in his earth walk. He must have remembered when Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. See, Jesus was the master of hell now. And these new creation people had received this authority. He saw joy-filled hearts where tears had been their only drink. He saw the defeated become masters. He saw his slaves shaking off their manacles. He saw homes that had been filled with misery turned into miniature heavens. He saw his prisoners set free. He saw men and women become new creations. These new creations became Jesus' men and women. They counted the things that were not as though they were, and they leaped into being. And they counted the things that were as though they were not, and they ceased being. He saw faith grow where doubt and fear had held the throne for years. He saw a new race of men, a new species coming into being. He saw the new birth take place. He saw God take men out of his grip and fill their hearts with love where hatred had reigned supreme. He saw selfishness curtailed 
entailed. He saw righteousness become a reality. The strangest phenomenon was to see men and women stand in the presence of God without the sense of guilt, inferiority, or condemnation. This shook the very foundation of hell. A new language was spoken in the new creation family, a language permeated with love words. He saw men reign as kings in this new realm of life. He saw this new kind of love gain mastery over men. Satan slew Jesus to annihilate him. Instead of that, his death and resurrection gave birth to this new creation family. And they multiplied so rapidly that he realized he's got to go try to destroy them before they destroyed him. Listen, when you hear stuff like that, You can't convince me that your life is filled at the bar or the ball field like it's going to be filled in the kingdom of heaven. So let me challenge just briefly, if you you just stand to your feet for just, we're going to go, but let's devote ourselves to God so much so that it drives a deep devotion to one another. Man, let's get around some tables with one another, especially, especially now. Let's plug in. I know we all have trips and all kind of stuff planned. Take time. Make time. Do it. But let's get into one of our, our table groups this summer. Um, we're doing something completely different in small groups. I think it launches today, right, Pastor Aaron? You may have some information on your chairs. Get in one of those table groups this summer or start one. It's not too late. Talk to Pastor Aaron. All it is is getting some people around your table to do life with for six weeks. Even if you can do two or three or four of them, do it. It'll be so valuable. Do it. Do it. You need it. We need this. For one another let's ask God for every gift that he has for us and lean into all that he is let's devote ourselves completely to his word to prayer to fellowship koinonia to remembrance communion Eucharist Lord's Supper let's do it may we find ourselves with a renewed sense of awe today at who God is and may we find ourselves so deeply drawn to be around the table with each other and with him after all Jesus used the table a lot in his mission methodology of developing life changing relationships with people and that's what we're after this summer amen father thank you for this church this house thank you for each and every person this family that you have uniquely woven together that you are continually growing father may we never be satisfied or stuck May we never seek status quo. May we never keep our eyes only focused inward. But God, I pray that your gospel, your good news message would so grip our lives that we can't help ourselves. We not only proclaim it, we portray it. We not only say it, we live it. And God, it becomes attractive in every way to every person we come in contact with. God, we in faith ask for salvation to pour out into this community. God, use this house in that way, we pray. God, we ask you for healings to take place in this community. Use this house, we pray, Jesus. And God, give us this deep balance, if you will, for your scripture and your spirit. And God, may we trust you all of our days in everything that you have called us to. We believe in faith. You will bring into fruition that which you began in us. And it is a good work. It is a good work. Listen, if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, you want to be a part of a family that will have your back. Can we just make a covenant together right now? We're going to have each other's backs, amen? We're going to have each other's backs. Just say it. I'm going to have your back. I'm going to have your back. I got your six. And you know what? We're also going to have the the back of all the other Jesus-centered churches in this area. We're going to have the back of all the Jesus-centered churches in our world. These are our brothers and sisters. So if if you do not have a relationship with Jesus today, would you pray with me just like this? Jesus, I want you. I need you. Thank you that you loved me enough that you invite me to your table. You include me. I belong. Thank you for forgiving me right in this moment of all my sin. Empty me of all my past. And fill me with your Holy Spirit, I pray right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, can we just applaud and let's just thank God. Come on, give him your best for a minute. Pastor Aaron's going to come and dismiss us today. Amen. That's good stuff, isn't it? Hey, I've got a few announcements for you, so stick with me. This is super important.